Welcome to the Teach Me Lit podcast. I'm Sophie Tuvey and I love talking about books and helping you to revise for English literature and go deeper in the texts you're studying. Today I'm talking about a poem called From Father to Son. Uh, by Emia Humphreys and this poem is part of the collection on WJC English Literature's um, Poetry Anthology. Um, I'm going to be thinking specifically about the idea of memory in this poem um, but I'm going to sort of try and unpack the meaning of the poem and how you can read it and interpret it as well. So the poem begins, there is no limit to the number of times your father can come to life and he is as tender as ever he was. And that to me um, is really talking about the way that after a loved one has died, the memories of them come back as a recurring event and they can be triggered by a number of different things but you know you can be really caught unawares, you're not expecting to get that memory and all of a sudden it will come upon you. The fact that there's no limit to this suggests that it's a repeated cycle that the grieving person goes through. Um, And in a sense, you initially expect that this poem is gonna be quite positive. The title, From Father to Son, It sounds like a a label on a Christmas present. Um, It sounds like a very positive bond. But as the poem develops, you see that the speaker of the poem, the persona, has very ambivalent emotions towards his father, a mixture of both positive and negative. It says he is as tender as ever he was and as poor. So you've got the juxtaposition there of tender, a positive feature, with poor, a negative one. It describes his overcoat buttoned to the throat, his face blue from the wind that always blows in the outer darkness. And, you know, I'm getting that sense of, you know, poor, coldness, darkness, you know, none of this is very positive, is it? The the atmosphere of the poem here is quite um, sombre. Um, And it's like the father's appearance is like a ghost. And it makes me think of Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, again, the ghost of Christmas past. Um, this kind of spirit of the father is there, but the, the son doesn't really want to be seeing this, and it's an uncomfortable image. He comes towards you, hesitant, unwilling to untru- intrude, and yet driven at the point of love to this encounter. So the father is, is kind of separated from the son. Um, the father sort of comes towards the son but is hesitant and that that word suggests to me the father doesn't want to intrude on on the son's life perhaps that reflects what he was like when um he was alive we don't really know do we but i i think the caesura the pause after you with the comma in the middle of the line that caesura is quite um tense because Initially, like this, this figure coming towards you could even be seen as threatening. Um, hesitant is non-threatening, but that pause is quite pregnant with like um, emotion as, as the son is wondering how to respond to the father. The fact that the word love is placed at the end of the penultimate line of the stanza is quite significant as well because You can't help but emphasise it. Um, And by pausing after saying at the point of love, it does bring this this complex emotion of love into into the story of the poem. There's no doubt in the poem that there is love between the father and the son, but it's not necessarily shown in a conventional way. Um, And I think that really gets developed in the second stanza. You may think that love is all that is left of him, but when he comes, he comes with all his winters and all his wounds. Now, I love the way that you see techniques combining to create an effect here. 
because um, you've got the repetition of when he comes, he comes with, um, and then the alliteration of the winters and the wounds, um, the parallel construction of all his winters and all his wounds, to me, um, just serve to emphasise these negative things. And your winter is 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 no one's favourite time of year. Usually, it's it's cold, and and um, we associate it with death because it's the time of the year when nature is dying, and all his wounds. So the baggage, the emotional baggage, or whatever that he's carrying around with him. He stands shivering in the empty street, cold and worn like a tramp at the end of a journey, and yet a shape of unquestioning love that you, uneasy and hesitant of the cold touch of death, must embrace. Now, I love this really uncomfortable image, um, and you know you really need to unpick the simile here, that the father is compared to a tramp, you know, a homeless person. And I was thinking about how you have often have a very mixed emotions when you pass somebody homeless in the street. You often feel that sympathy and compassion of, um, you know, this person is obviously in a really difficult situation. You also feel guilt at your own situation, the fact that you have privilege and you have so much more than they do. Um, and then you also feel this sense of revulsion or a sense of fear um, a kind of what need to distance yourself from the homeless person and I think that mixture of emotions is exactly what the son is feeling here when he sees the um, the shape of his father in his memory he's got that sense of of sympathy and compassion and love and that bond with his father but he's also got this kind of weird guilt he can't get rid of um, he's got a sense of revulsion that he can't ignore. The fact that he doesn't rush out to embrace the father. Um, and I was, t- I was talking um, with my class about how um, in the Bible you've got the story of the prodigal son. Um, and in that story, the son um, wastes all, the, all his father's money and is quite rebellious. Um, and at, at rock bottom point in his life, he does decide to come back to the father. And his intention is to just work for his father as a servant. But his father sees him coming from a distance and runs out to meet him. Um, you know, throws his arms around him and, and tells the servants to start a party. Um, and, and as the son tries to say, oh, don't worry, dad, I'll, I'll work for you. He sort of brushes him off and, you know, says, oh, don't worry about that. Gives him a robe and a ring. And celebrates his return. Now, what I think is really interesting about this poem is that it's the exact opposite. You know, the father's the one um, who's like the prodigal son. You know, he's the poor one. He's the one who's lost everything, and the son then presumably is the one with all the power. The son is the one um, who really should go out to meet the father, but he doesn't. Um, and I also was thinking about um, the movie Beauty and the Beast with the beginning of that film where the prince um, is in his castle and the hag comes up to him and asks for some food and shelter um, and the prince sort of you know casts her aside because she's ugly and she says, you know, you might want to think about that first um, and offers him the rose um, and then the, the prince still refuses and it's a test. Um, and he's failed the test and then he gets turned into a beast um, but it, if you think about this poem as a test um, does the son pass or fail the test well I think he fails because it takes him the whole poem to sort of decide what to do um, you know he's looking at this father he's obviously feeling this mixture of emotions oh, should, I, should I go but he's hesitant of the cold touch of death um, and I think, you know, there's obviously that sense of of not wanting to make contact, not wanting to have that connection. So there's this division between um, the son and, and the dead father. And perhaps that, that is a metaphor, perhaps as a metaphor about death itself, you know, being this barrier between us and the ones we love when they, when you know, this, this grief that the son's dealing with is very difficult. And notice the final stanza then, after the word embrace, you've got this stanza break. And if you like, we're on the edge of our seats wondering, you know, is the son going to 
go towards the father and actually make that connection. Um, and this is the final stanza. Then, before you can touch him, he's gone, leaving on your fingers a little more of his weariness, a little more of his love. Now, again, I think the caesura is really effective here after the word gone, because it just brings us to that moment of, of anticlimax. The moment we were, hit, we were waiting for didn't happen. Um, the son didn't go back to the father. Um, but it's interesting the poet doesn't leave the poem there. I think if the poem ended with he is gone, it would be quite abrupt um, and I, obviously a bit of a letdown for the reader. The fact there's this extra detail then, leaving on your fingers a little more of his weariness, a little more of his love, you've got a parallel construction with these two lines. Weariness, tiredness is a negative thing, but the poem ends with the word love. And again, I think the placement of that is so significant. It was the penultimate line of stanza one. So love is threaded through this poem in every single stanza, um, even though it doesn't look like what we expect it to. Um, and I think there's, to me, there's that hope that given the start of the poem says there's no limit to the number of times, if you go from the end of the poem back to the beginning again, then you think actually there's a cycle here and there's hope. Because if this is a recurring um, image of the father returning to the son, the son will have future opportunities to do the right thing, to, to pass the test, to do things differently. Um, and so I really love the structure of the poem because it is a cycle, it's not a linear poem. I feel like when you go back to the end, you're supposed to go back to the beginning again um, and the cycle begins again of the father appearing. So I definitely think it's worth exploring the ambiguity of the poem. And, and by ambiguity, I mean the fact that it isn't a very clear cut um, interpretation. You, you can see both positive and negative emotions of the persona of the poet um, and it would be definitely worth exploring the way that language and structure and imagery all work together to create this sense of mixed emotion which makes a really powerful effect in the poem. <laughs> If you've enjoyed this podcast and found it helpful, please hit subscribe and share it with a friend. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Just search for Teach Me Lit. I'm always open to requests. So if you want me to talk about a text you're studying, get in touch. Thank you for listening. See you next time on the Teach Me Lit podcast.